The Bat Chat. Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Steve Baxley. Welcome back to The Bat Chat. Today we're going to talk about one of Steve's favorite episodes, and mine too, I Am The Knight. Yes, we're talking about I Am The Knight, which is, um, in case you haven't seen it already, it's an, ep- it's an episode where Batman just sits there questioning himself for most of the, for most of the runtime. That's right, yeah. He's, he's, he's insecure, he's really unsure about himself, and it, it's really introspective. But I am constantly distracted by the size of the the uh, bat circle changing constantly. <laughs> That's such a weird thing about this episode. There's a couple of scenes. There's that really touching scene where where Batman's staring down at Jim Gordon in the hospital bed, and he doesn't have the circle at all. Yeah, and I just I get so distracted by that that I can't even think about this show, this episode, uh, in a, about its its character or its psychology at all. <laughs> Because of that. Anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, if you want to watch it with us, get out your DVD or watch it on... I almost said get out your Amazon Prime. Go to your bookshelf. Go, go to your DVD shelf. Get out your Amazon Prime. Get out your physical copy of Amazon Prime. That's right. Your physical copy of, of, of streaming Amazon Prime. Get it to timestamp zero. Make sure you're watching I Am The Night and not some other episode. And if you want to listen to it without watching it, we'll do our level best to provide a little bit of context so you can do that. And we're going to get started here in just a second. Is everybody ready? I don't know about everybody, but I am. Oh, good. Steve Baxi is ready. Everybody, <laughs> please press play right now. So, Steve, so before- I still love your idea of having a trilogy called I Am Vengeance, I Am the Night, I Am Batman. That would be so much fun because I hate that line. I've always, I've always been one of those people that thinks Batman saying I am vengeance, I am the knight is out of character, particularly in this incarnation. In, in this version, yeah. I, I mean, you have to give it a pass because it happens so early. Exactly. Like, it, it is one of those, like, them finding their footing things. But it's a line that's stuck everywhere. And I, I think it's only stuck because it sounds cool, not because it means anything. No, people like it because it sounds super edgy. And there are versions of Batman where you can make a case that he is about vengeance, but in in order for him to be sympathetic and endearing, he has to walk that line and not know it. Exactly, and I mean I, I, that's why I think or be episode... afraid of it. You know, for for Batman to go, ah, I'm kind of worried that I'm that I'm not really about justice. Yeah. Yeah, which is exactly why I would want like a trilogy of episodes or like a comic of Batman that that one of the issues or episodes would be called I Am Vengeance, so we can like dissect and see does Batman see himself as vengeful? Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, first thing I want to mention about this episode before we get too far into it is that I like Kevin Conroy as Batman. I think he's good. I've never had this attachment to him that everyone else on the planet seems to, but I think this is his best performance as Batman. I think this is absolutely the best job he's ever done. Do you think particular episodes like this one, where where we get real character stuff for him to do, and he has to give an and, and he has to give a real like emotional like like range, you know, for his yeah. performance? Do you think that has uh, a lot to do with why people are so obsessed with him as as or, or, or the idea that he is the definitive Batman, or is it just they like that voice? <sighs> It's tough to say. I feel like a lot of it is just I like the voice because there's such a disproportionate amount of Kevin Conroy doing like real character driven Batman versus just being Batman because he signed on as Batman. And like, especially when you look at like all those DC animated movies and stuff, like he's just there because people demand him be there. He's not doing anything with them. And most of the show, I feel like the show has m- more bad episodes than it has good episodes. So there's the I Batman like face palm. There's the meme. It's everywhere. Oh, yeah, it is the beam. I also love that he just has a cave-shaped chair. It's fantastic. That is the most spawn that Batman will ever look. Yeah. I think it's important to note that this came out just a couple of years after that started. Yeah. (laughs) Or or, or even a year and a half, maybe, uh, after Spawn started. And he he slumped in his chair like Spawn in the alleyway. This episode, this particular episode is done by Sunrise, which is a studio that's kind of hit and miss with animation. Like, Heart of Steel looks pretty good, but Pretty Poison and Cat in the Claw are eh, and then Off Balance is, it has some good animation, some bad animation. Um, in this episode, I think they're, like, very consciously trying to make it a bit more de- detailed, which is why things just look like they're reacting slower. Yeah, I'm not sure the, if that's, maybe that's just me, but it feels like in places, like people are just not moving at full speed. 
Yeah, I mean, as we mentioned, or I never thought of that. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, there are some 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 pretty glaring mistakes in the animation. Yeah, but, yeah, with the bad symbol and stuff. But, like, the faces, I think, work really well. Yeah, and there's certainly this deliberate attempt at an atmosphere that goes with this uh, character arc that Batman has. Yeah, this is not the same studio that did Never Too Late, um, but it really reminds me of that episode visually. I really love the idea that... I, I really love this show commenting on, on Batman popularity and merchandise. Oh, yeah, that's great. Because it was so big right right then. I mean, obviously, as we always talk about, this show happened because of 89. It was one of the most merchandised movies ever. It was one of the first big event movies the way it was an event movie. Uh, the print soundtrack was the first time anything like that had ever happened, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then this show had, of course, a ridiculous amount of merchandising going along with it as well. So there's... Uh, there, there's a bit of a commentary going on there with, uh, in, with this world and the real world simultaneously. Of you know, what is is Batman really standing for anything? Does he really mean anything if he if people have missed the point to to the point where they just buy stuff that he's that his symbol is on because he looks cool? Yeah, yeah. Because just as you said that, we're talking over the scene where Batman says that. Every time he comes here, he doesn't know if it should be the last time. And I love that you that you mentioned that, and we contrast that with this notion that the people of Gotham have kind of become accustomed to Batman always being there. They've sort of almost built that reliance the way Lex Luthor accuses Metropolis of doing with Superman. And so I, I think it's really interesting that Batman has a crisis of conscience right when he's probably at the height of his career. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, when, when the city... Uh, like, like, like when he's kind of needed most, he's worried that he's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the stuff with the kid in this actually works pretty well, particularly because we we have Robin in the previous episode and Robin in this episode. Um, I think that, and then we had the kid put on the Batman costume in the story. I think the young versus old theme he had in the previous episode. I think that's that's probably m m even more at play here because that's what Batman is about. Batman is about when we get to like the uh, the Justice Lord stuff in Justice League. Um, he's about no little kid um, losing their parents because of some punk with a gun. He's all about children. It's important that that guy's young. Yeah. And it's important that he's in this alley. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a thing that happens a lot. Um, Batman, the day Batman's parents die is, is like every single holiday ever. And it's also every single alley ever. <laughs> so. uh, this is, this is one of my favorite facial expressions in this entire show. Oh yeah. <laughs> when, when Batman picks up and, and I mean, not, not, not laughing at it. Like I love it when he, when he looks at the roses and he just looks like, 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 like appalled. There's so much of like Batman in this episode realizing how fanatical he is. Yeah. And I really like that. I, I love this notion that Batman puts these flowers there as a routine, but I wonder, because the episode doesn't really explore this, but it makes me want, it just makes me curious. Like, I, I wonder if Batman ever stops to think um, just how how detrimental um, him doing that constantly might be. Um, like, there's a thing You mean, in, like, to in, his own psyche? To his own psyche and to Gotham as a whole. Like, because he does it, he puts the flowers on the grave every year. And then he comes back to the place they died every year. And then he's does, he does this thing in the comics where Crime Alley has actually turned into the safest place in all of Gotham I because people know Batman always shows up there. And so they make it makes him more predictable. So I, I like the idea that, like, maybe this whole routine he has, this whole, like, undying love for his parents is making him less effective. Yeah, and it's also... You, you also That's a cool shot. Yeah, that's a great shot. It's also fun to have the discussion of whether or not that's really unhealthy for him, for 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 him psychologically. Yeah, because yeah. it humanizes Batman to have to have him uh, constantly having to remind himself uh, that he is that he's depressed and angry about what happened to his parents. Like, he like he has to do things to keep up how he feels about that in order to do his job. Like, like, yeah. like there are there are some versions where um, he seems to just be different than anybody else on the planet where he's not able to get over it. And I think it's more realistic to think that he's a guy who refuses to allow himself to get over it and, and his that, that's part of his refusal to change as the protagonist, where he uh where where if he, he could he could actually maybe not easily, but he could actually get complacent 
and start to get over it, and he keeps doing things to make himself angry. Exactly, and I, there, there's a very good contrast to that where, where Dick Grayson tries to be the voice of reason for him in this episode, and very clearly he's gotten over his parents' death. And that's part of why I love Grant Morrison's run as much as I do, is that there's a very conscious decision on Morrison's part to make sure we understand that Batman, Bruce Wayne as a person, is now over his parents' death, that this is no longer about them. And of course, right now, he's forcing it to still be that. I, I love the conf this being part of the conflicted nature of Batman, that he has to keep uh, doing that in, in order to be effective, but at the same time, it, he's you know, he said at the beginning of the episode, he's tired. Like, yeah. that takes so much out of him, and if he's not effective enough, what is the point of doing that to his mind? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, and that goes along so well with Mask of the Phantasm. Oh, it does, like, yeah. you put this and in, in, in that movie together, I think that they're, like, not straight-up companion pieces, but I think emotionally for Batman they kind of are. Yeah, I there, there there is a lot of, like, Batman at the beginning of his career, Batman in the middle of his career, and Batman at the end of his career when you pair that with this episode and then Return of the Joker at the end. Oh, that's a great point, yeah. Um, so, ten years... I think 10 years after this, um, there's a story post No Man's Land called Officer Down, um, which is one of those new Gotham era books. And it goes through all the Bat books at the time, which is the basic premise is just this of Jim Gordon gets hurt and Batman's having an existential crisis about it. Yeah. Um, I read it years ago and I remember hating it, but I haven't gone back to it. So I don't know if it holds up. We should do a vault. I've got it. We should. I read it then, too, and remember being kind of indifferent to it. Yeah, I don't... Because there, there were two new Gotham stories at that point. Two very specific ones. Um, one of them was Officer Down. The other one's name I'm blanking on. And the other one was a Ra's al Ghul story that I loved. And then Officer Down, I really hated. So I don't, I don't know why. I'll have to so, go back to that. So we have a mob boss here called the Jazz Man. Could we get an over-the-top costume supervillain called that? And get, like, a, a costume that goes with Jazz Man... The Jazz Man is Music Meister's sidekick. Because I just, I would love that. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, That'd be we, awesome. did, we didn't mention this at the beginning, but when Batman's sitting in, in his cave throne, he has, a, he's looking at a newspaper that says that Penguin got out of jail again. And I just love that uh, if you watch this in order, it probably wasn't on purpose, but like two episodes ago, he got put in prison. <laughs> like we just saw that happen. Yeah, got, that's a good point. And he got out, and it was, and it was this, it was this episode about him casting himself as as the bad guy on purpose and stuff. <laughs> and, and, that's and, and, interesting. Like, even though we, we we ultimately didn't like that episode, I I kind of I kind of like the idea that that Batman's looking at the paper after that episode, going, "I'm not accomplishing anything." Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a really good like gut punch for him and um we also saw like the bat the sad batman meme a second ago with like his head down sad um, batman but it works so well in this context like he's when you say that like this is batman questioning his convictions it's batman dealing with whether or not what he's doing is effective and it's him having both people that that need him and hate him at the same time i like how there's just there's no simple answer to this episode like no. even by the end i think a lot of what batman's doing could still be questioned yeah, I like that there's not an easy answer, that it doesn't end with, no, Batman, everything you're doing is perfect. I love this scene as well. I love how he's about to tear up his office. Yeah, he's, 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 he's having kind of a Kylo Ren fit here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, wow, Batman's very strong. He is. He also like, doesn't like to bolt things down, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> this is maybe going a little too far, where Batman's I, able to pick up I, like like computers, like giant supercomputers, and throw them. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. It's part of it's the aesthetic too. Like I feel like he's got like five or six machines that are just isolated in this one location with yeah, nothing what, else by them. What do they even do? Do they just regulate the temperature? Like what, what are they for? <laughs> I don't know. They're they're just there. <laughs> um, I but I do like that ending. Like yell he gives that's kind of melodramatic but i think it totally fits this episode well, i like it too and i like how animalistic that is yeah um i, I don't know there, there's getting... just something about this episode where like everything is something that works for me we've talked about this before but i like what uh what courtrooms look like in this show oh yeah that's not as over the top as we've seen them before like we've had courtrooms before where they're where that I, although i think it's always that exact same judge 
that 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 lady that that somewhat uh, heavy set lady judge. <laughs> but that's a good point. But I uh, but there was that one where she's like fifty feet in the air. Oh, that's true. That's talking down to the guy. But I but I like this. But I but I like this uh, this very like pulp throwback uh, courtroom where yeah. where it feels like it goes on for for miles in any direction. It doesn't feel like a room. It feels like you're in a black abyss. Yeah, there's a lot of like weird perspective shifts with this one that I kind of like. Um, I also like that Alfred very consciously brings Dick Grayson into this. That he doesn't just show up out of nowhere. That's a really good point. He like, um, calls him up and brings him in. And again, these were aired in a different order, but it's unusual to have two Robin episodes in, in a row. This is true, yeah. Um, it feels more special that way, and I also like that Batman's in costume for most of this, and, and Robin isn't. I, I didn't even think of that. That's great. Um, I think, because yeah, I think it just speaks so much to, like, Bruce putting on a front and not knowing it for a while, and Dick Grayson's come to this point where I think he's matured out of what happened to him, and Bruce still hasn't. So, like, Dick just standing there as, like, an accomplished good person trying to reason with Batman who isn't able to be that, I think is, is an interesting mix. Well, and once again, it's important that... I don't mean to keep... to beat a dead horse, but it, it's it's important to note that, that Batman hasn't just not gotten over his parents' death, but he's refusing to, and that's why he keeps the costume on. Yeah. Uh, he... You know, the conversation they're having right now, uh, Dick says, you know, you're only human, and he's he thinks that he has to be more than human in order to do what he's doing, but the humanity in him uh, is, is, is of course, making him doubt whether he's, whether he's able to continue doing that or if it's even warranted. Um, yeah. It's hard not to think about the, the kind of, uh, you know, Iron Man Age of Ultron question a little oh, bit, yeah, a little sure. bit with this episode. Um, you know, you know, if I, if we can't at some point quit doing this, then are we, are we just kind of spitting into the wind? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's lots of, like, good camera angles in this episode that I think, like, help warn some of that. Like, just a second ago, when Dick was pre pleading with Bruce, we, like, looked up at him, and then we looked at Batman on our terms. Like, it, it seems like it's very conscious about, like, what where these characters are morally standing and where they're going. Um, and, again, I, I still submit that Batman the Animated Series is probably the weakest of the Batman shows, but it's episodes like this where I can totally see why people love it as much as they do. Well, and yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're saying weakest. You're, you're saying weakest because we've improved on it. That's that's a good thing. I mean, I mean, if story wise, you know, we, we have we have been able to improve on it. Um, well, I mean, just I, I still submit. I still think that Batman the Animated Series is just an okay show in general. Like, I don't think it's a great cartoon. Okay, yeah, I think it was. I think it was at the time. That's fair. I think comparatively, when you look at it up against anything else we'd had yet, it's a great cartoon. That's fair. I comparatively sure. I just think like historically, it, it's. I don't think it's as great as its legacy warrants. Like people, sub, people say that this is the greatest Batman has ever been. I just don't agree with that. Yeah, I mean, we could have that argument. It, it's it's. Uh, again, I think it's good if we have been able to improve on it. Uh, we we've. I think we've gotten more sophisticated with storytelling and cartoons that aren't just we cut out? little children in general. Steve, can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. I think we cut out there for a second. Oh, okay. Um, what timestamp are we on? Are we still on 16? Uh, I'm at like 17.11. 17.11, okay. Um, I'm at 16. I'm in 17 now, okay. We should okay. be fine. Um, I wish the Jazzman would come back. I think that's a cool name for a villain. Like, like you mentioned, we should have like a costume for it, but I also think it's a cool name for a mob boss. Yeah, yeah, he could have been he could have been like Thorn or something. And yeah, been, yeah, that could be cool. Been in a number of episodes. Yeah. Um, I like just how much Bruce has given up at this point. Like he's he's not even gonna like like put on a suit or anything. He's just gonna sit there, and he just looks so disheveled. It's cool. I'm a little ahead of you, where as you're saying that he's in costume swinging around. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I've just got to that part. <laughs> yeah. we'll, be, we'll, we'll make that work. <laughs> um, Corner of Adams and O'Neill. Two of the most obvious Batman writers you could possibly put together. When you look at 
like comic book shows now, isn't it crazy just how every show must do creator street signs? Yep, we do it all like the time. Like everything is a creator street sign now. It still felt it still felt clever at the beginning of Arrow, and now we do it everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's just, it's crazy how numb I've I've gotten to some of that stuff at this point. I mean, numb is not necessarily the right word. You know, sometimes it's still fun, and I don't mean to say that I don't appreciate Easter eggs sometimes, but it's become almost obligatory. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, I th I think it, with certain shows, we're almost preaching to the choir with some of these Easter eggs. Yeah, but sometimes we get so we we get like super super obscure. Yeah. Uh, in in order to not look obvious, and I'm like, you know, you you could just put in things that aren't necessarily a reference to the, you can do that sometime doesn't have to be a reference my favorite cameo slash easter egg in a, in a comic book property is still Zaz and Batman Begins I feel like that's the cleverest way to do these kinds of things oh see I wouldn't have even thought of that as an easter egg because no one else would know who that was unless you know Batman I feel like it's perfect and you, like, you've got like the subtle scars the actor would have been perfect he's on trial I, I feel like it works into that story and as an easter egg simultaneously and I wish we could just do more of that more of that yeah um, yeah, because that's just organically working a character in. Exactly. Um, and if you wanted to do a sequel with Zaz, you easily could have. Uh, setting up Barbara Gordon some more. Yeah, she hasn't shown up since Heart of Steel, I don't think. No, you're right. And I, I was sitting in a rack of my brain trying to remember where we saw her last. Um, that Batgirl, was her introduction, was it not? Yeah, that was her introduction. Um, the Batgirl episode, I think, is still a little ways off. I didn't think we got it till three. Yeah, I think it is three. I don't know how far into two, volume two we are, though. Nobody ever talks about the shape of these batarangs. I just love them. Oh, yeah, they're great. And they're really practical. Yeah, yeah, they are. Because um, they're, super, they're super sharp. Uh, like, they make a triangle. Yeah. And so they're really sharp on all three. Like, like it's, you know, it's it's a it's a shuriken thing. And, I mean, obviously, when, when like, Batman Begins has that, too. But then they're, they've got those they've got those like rounded edges on the sides and I just think that they're they're much more actual shuriken looking I'm surprised we don't like because you can buy batarangs that function as real like boomerangs and shuriken I'm surprised we haven't used that design for one of those I like how much Batman looks up to Jim Gordon and how it's it's him pulling through this that kind of brings him back from the brink was it this show, or was it somewhere else that we make the connection that Gordon is Bruce's father's age? Yes, it's this show. Was it this show? Okay, yeah. I, I like that they added that. I think that's a cool... I think it's spin. this episode. Is it this episode? That he says that. I, I can't remember, but it's, it's in something I watched recently, so I'm almost positive it's this episode. Okay, it's probably this episode then. Um, I always like that idea. I think it's really cool, and I think it makes a lot of sense for why Batman would immediately gravitate to Jim Gordon as much as he does. Yeah. Um, and I like him seeing him as a father figure because he's 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 obviously so different from him but cares about the same things. Yeah. Um this kid only has two moments. The the opening stuff with the alley and then this ending, and I'm surprised how well it works by the end. Yeah. Like that could have very easily just felt kinda cheesy and I think it doesn't. And it also could have been a cheesy A story for like a whole episode. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that could have been really problematic. Where like we were like we follow this this idiot punk irritating kid. Yeah. That, and, I mean, and, and, and then and then like obligatorily he's got a character arc where he comes to appreciate Batman and you get to the end and you know, I mean like hey, that could work. But I but I really like that we didn't make that the whole episode. Yeah, and I mean we've established that this is a Batman that likes to like tail people for a while. So doing it wouldn't have been out of the realm of possibility. But I do like this idea better that it's just within um it's just like within a bigger story yeah and that's that's really important because batman is realizing that he needs to keep doing what he's doing and it's worth doing because of the individuals yeah so yeah it's not exactly. about saving the world necessarily he is just one man it's about it, and like and like you said with children especially uh, he, after what happened to his parents, could have very easily gone down the same path as that kid or way worse. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Jason Todd always tends to represent something like that, of, like, Bruce going off the deep end. Yeah, the the other direction that that can go. Yeah. Um, I'm, I had fun talking about this. This is still one of my favorite episodes. It's still one of those I go back to from time to time. Yeah, it's... And, and Batman never gets more expressive than he does in that episode. 
Yeah. Um, there are places where the animation kind of doesn't work, but overall I think it does look really good in the moments where it counts. Yeah, and I think the broodiness, uh, you, know, you know, the kind of, like, like I don't want to say whininess, I can't think of a better word, but like I think that goes... Like the angstiness of it. The, yeah, it, it goes a little too far. Just because I can see that. it's a cartoon and we're trying to drive the point home. I think when he is when he's pontificating in the Batcave and he's talking with big arms, that's going too far. That's fair. Yeah. Like even even Batman being at at, at maybe maybe one of his worst place and being really unsure of himself, I just don't think that he talks with Shakespearean arms. <laughs> no, that that's, that's it's unintentionally it. funny. Is the point I'm making? There's a little bit of like, this is heavily censored kids cartoon, but look at what it got away with, almost gloating in places. Oh yeah, there's a lot of that, but I but I think that the, that's more of a place of it's trying to be a serious character piece, but it's a it's a little afraid that the kids aren't going to be along with it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair. And so it, it gets into melodramatic territory, uh, which yeah. is a credit to the show on the whole that that I can even complain about that. Yeah. Um, so far, of, of the ones we reviewed, I think it's probably my favorite of Volume 2. Oh, yeah? I think so. Um, I know Perchance to Dream was in this volume, but I still think... I don't know. I think on this viewing, I like this one more. I feel like we were both more excited when we were talking about that. Probably. It's hard but to say. This is it's course, a kind of a list that always evolves the more I watch the show. But, you know, being a more fun to talk about episode doesn't make it a better episode. That's true. Necessarily. Yeah. I mean, that is a really fun episode to talk about. Yeah. And we get and we get to talk about how reading backwards in dreams is just not a thing. <laughs> I don't know where they problem. got that. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly the same thing as dreams last 45 seconds. What? <laughs> There's a time where people, where, where, where some people thought that there, there was, there was like a, it's like a study and people like, yeah, every dream is 45 seconds. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not how that works. Oh, that's hilarious. 10% of our brain is not a thing. I can't believe people still make movies on that premise. <laughs> Why was Lucy made? Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you next week when we'll be talking about, what, the Count Vertigo episode? Yeah, Off Balance. Off Balance. Is it actually Count Vertigo or is it just a guy that looks like Count Vertigo? I think it's no, actually it, Count. it is Count Vertigo and it's also the first appearance of uh, Talia al Ghul. Talia al Ghul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks a lot for listening. We'll see you next week. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Steve Baxi. <laughs>